Okay, so welcome back. Here we are with chapter nine, event utilities and scripting. And this is the chapter where we really learn how to hook up all sorts of different things to each other. We've seen already in event animation and interpolation how we can uh, connect interpolators, how we can uh, uh, build animation chains. In chapter eight, we learned how to augment that with user activity and how different sensor nodes can act as triggers and event producers for what we're trying to do. Well, in this chapter, we put it all together. Uh, we had good functionality before. Now we just basically uh, uh, get rid of all the limits. And by putting together uh, utility nodes that give us glue for different Boolean logic or timestamp trigger logic, and, uh, we can connect most things to most other things. And then finally with script, we have a general event producing and event consuming mechanism where we can write our own functionality to do math, to process the logic of complicated sequence of events, basically, basically to do whatever the author really wants to accomplish. Okay, so our uh, structure remains the same. We'll go through uh, the conceptual overview and then node by node through each of the uh, utilities and uh, script node. And then we'll look at a few additional resources and suggested exercises. So let's start with the overview. Uh, we didn't always have event utility nodes. The, this set of nodes did not exist in uh, Vermal 97. And they came about because a lot of people complained about how hard it was to hook up logic sometimes about whether something was turning on or turning off or when, what started a step. Uh, we found ourselves writing scripts to connect that much more frequently than we cared to. That it, was, it just seemed like a lot of work to do some basic uh, cause and effect type production. So the simple way to look at these things is that they convert data types. Uh, sometimes they'll convert the logic, they'll flip a true to a false, but other times they'll convert a boolean to a timestamp or vice versa so that we can wire up these things in our animation chains and, and, and get the connections to make sense. We also found in Verbal 97 that something that we weren't able to do very well was to sequence booleans or sequence integers, in other words, push out a stream of them, a changing set of numbers that would uh, uh, react over time, cause animation changes over time. We were very good at all of the floating point things like scalar interpolator, uh, position interpolator, orientation interpolator, even coordinate interpolator. But when it came to synchronizing the logic of turning the lights on and off, or starting and stopping uh, an audio clip, that was much harder. So those were other event utility that, utilities that we added, the sequencer nodes. The sequencers are quite similar to interpolators. Functionally, they're structured almost identically. The main difference is that they have discrete, either Boolean or integer values that are coming out. And when these values get produced, they only get produced one at a time because they're not changing and we don't need to push a constantly changing set of floats like a scalar interpolator might. Okay, then uh, you can see the list here. Our, our utility nodes uh, are for the Booleans. We have a filter, a sequencer, a toggle node, and a trigger. And then similarly for uh, integers, we have a sequencer and a trigger. And then we also have a time trigger and again, uh, most of these things are organized for, uh, for connection and conversion of data types. So if we look at the concepts and then the motivations of these guys, uh, certainly events and routes are fundamental to X3D animation. And uh, we do want every node in the scene graph to be a candidate for changing over time, for getting routed an event that modifies its value. So these nodes are uh, designed to help simplify that and help uh, make it easier to do. Okay, 
<clears throat> now let's look at the uh, further motivation on these guys. Uh, uh, we did find that uh, the tiebreaker in most things, do we need a new node or not, was uh, frequency of use and ease of use. So whenever we found the same script getting written over and over and over again to accomplish certain basic tasks, then that elevated the task to a candidate for a best practice, indeed for a, for a full-fledged node. And so we're working our way through to make sure that we can do this kind of stuff without needing script nodes every single time. That's important uh, in the future too as browsers get smarter and as they instead of solely implementing the interactive profile or excuse me the the, the immersive profile matching uh, all of Vermal 97 or the full profile the kitchen sink instead if they're interactive or even interchange small lightweight uh, browsers in the, in the interactive profile using these nodes would let you hook things up and that's important because you don't have the script node there. Script is considered kind of heavyweight. So as we start producing mobile content where scripting might not be allowed, this gets more valuable. Okay, and I think we should probably look at the uh, notes for this particular uh, slide. <coughs> there we go. So this is where we describe a little bit about interactive profile. Uh, it's also a little easier to learn. We've lumped the utilities and the script node together, but you don't have to know the script node to figure out how these other little things to go. And we might find there are still a few edge cases in the spec where we want to make sure we have further converters. Okay, so now let's compare some of these things. Uh, Boolean filter, Boolean toggle. So you might guess they're, they're concerned with true, false, or Boolean logic. If you haven't looked at Boolean logic before, I can definitely recommend it. By a mathematician named George Bool many many years ago uh, and turn of the century actually and uh, uh, he showed how uh, almost any logical construct could be reduced to a set of true false conditions okay mm -hmm. uh, then we have uh, sequencers for booleans and integers producing those single values at a time The trigger nodes, <coughs> excuse me, the trigger nodes uh, produce uh, a timestamp after getting some kind of triggering input. So this extends the functionality that we could use to trigger different functionality. And then finally, our script node, our uh, very important uh, extensibility node for X3D, where we get to extend the functionality of what inputs can produce what outputs. So very big for the extensibility. Try again. <coughs> Try over here. There we go. Okay. Jeff, we're going to have to pause here because <coughs> my throat is blocking. <coughs> we don't have to stop it, but you'll need to drop it for Just a few minutes. I've got some, pardon? Just take a note of the time code. Thanks. This is some serious medicine, so I already took one of these, so. Uh, don't overdo it. Let me get the head. 
overall execution of the primary and the whole thing is still in the future. Yeah, she can recover. Expenses are for tuition, really expenses required for enrolled or attend to eligible educational institution. Yeah. Yeah, it says qualified expenses paid. Okay, so let's look at different kinds of programming now. Uh, first, declarative, declarative programming. This is a very interesting type of programming that uh, many people don't get exposed to in those terms. But what it is is something where the programming language is describing solutions to given types of problems and the computer tries to match when it encounters a problem to the solution. And uh, an example of this, simple example, one that maybe you weren't expecting is uh, HTML, uh, hypertext markup language for web pages. They declare what should be on a page, the layout of here's a header, here's a paragraph, here's the link, but it doesn't specifically tell the browser where to put the letters on the screen, or where to draw a hypertext link, or how big or how small to make the image. A lot of these things are left up to the discretion of the program. So the HTML page itself simply declares, well, here's what should be on my page. And the browser, the web browser, gets to figure out, how do I lay it out? That's uh, an XML language, HTML. Other languages are uh, programming languages. Prolog is uh, one of the more famous declarative languages where uh, it declares uh, rules that can be inferred upon and the logic of those goes uh, from left to right and, and jumps from rule to rule without necessarily being in a particular order that a programmer intended. Similarly, expert systems often contain rules for if you find this then do that, but if you find the other thing preferentially do the other response instead. Another uh, excellent language to show declarative response is XSLT. This is the uh, XML style sheet language for transformations. And what it does is it takes XML inputs, say in the form of a document, and then when you apply an XSLT style sheet, you'll get some kind of output. And that might be an XML output, or it might simply be uh, any kind of output, some other text or something else. 
Okay, we saw an example of this earlier uh, in the course when we applied a style sheet to an X3D scene that had an extrusion in it, and it took that extrusion data and converted it into a SVG diagram. So uh, our XSLT diagram, or example in that case was uh, X3D extrusion node and it got converted to uh, SVG. So the way that occurred, the language that did it, XSLT, is definitely a uh, declarative language because it's used to uh, uh, respond to the pieces in the scene graph, the X3D scene graph, in this case, that matter. Okay. By contrast, if that seems a little vague and fuzzy, this probably seems a lot more uh, direct and familiar, and that's imperative programming. Imperative programming is much more of a do this, do that, stepwise procedure of how should a program accomplish its steps. And this is how most programmers are used to programming, if you have learned to program. And uh, most people are comfortable with that programming. So sometimes declarative is a little bit of a, a step aside uh, for them. Uh, in any case, imperative is usually pretty straightforward. You have a, you start with something, you iterate it, you f iterate on a bunch of steps, you follow a procedure, and different results occur. So it's very directive, very imperative, getting told what to do, very clear how you get there. Okay, so if we compare the two, we can often think of declarative as sort of a top-down approach where we're looking at the document as a whole, in our case an X3D scene, and reacting to each piece as it occurs and producing it. If we think just conceptually of an X3D scene, uh, if you were trying to write a program to draw a chair, you'd have to get very specific about what triangles were being constructed and where do they go and how do I reorient them, and it would be uh, very difficult or at least very tedious to construct some of that. But if we look at an uh, X3D chair, we say, well, we'll make a leg, and then we'll make copies of the leg, and uh, then we'll put a seat on it. That'll just be a box, so we'll position a box there, and then we'll put another box on the background, on the back of the seat. Okay, so I got four cylinders, one of which is duplicated three times, and uh, two boxes, and a couple of transfer. That's it. We've just declared this is here, that's there. You go draw it, X3D browser. So, so there's a comparison between the two styles, and uh, uh, why we kind of like X3D because it's uh, often easier for many types of problems that we're trying to draw. We don't have to worry about the exact location of every single vertex, but rather can describe the results that we want. When it comes to the perspective of behaviors, this is uh, doubly true, because often we're, we're setting up these animation chains which just sort of passively sit there and wait for a user to come along with their mouse or their pointing device or just checking the clock and once those inputs start then events start shooting around the scene graph and one event gets picked up by another node and sent to another and the routes are connecting these things so you can think of it very much in the same way as you might look at a row of dominoes where each domino by itself is pretty simple and there's nobody necessarily in charge up above saying, okay, dominoes, I'm going to tell all of you what to do right now. That would be the imperative way of doing business. We, we don't have that. Instead, for each domino, we might say, okay, here are inputs you can listen to, and here is an output you can send, and uh, that input would be an event, that output would be an event. Oh, okay, so if we position these animation chains to affect one another, it's much like the dominoes ready to fall where we're tipping one and it uh, uh, 
each one just tips the next and tips the next and they'll all go down one after the other assuming they're set up properly but there's no controlling overall logic that makes that happen rather it's a series of events one after another the sequence that makes that occur <clears throat> okay so uh, relation to X3D. So here, here's a summary of why we think the scene graph is itself declarative. Uh, maybe we should list here, first of all, is uh, just of course the geometry. The way geometry is defined and placed is much more declarative in comparison to programming APIs of how you would accomplish that. But from a behavior uh, perspective, the uh, presence of different sensors and interpolators, in other words, event producers, and then the route connections that connect one thing to another, and then the destinations that collect where those values go, uh, that can all be thought of as a cause and effect chain, similar to our dominoes ready to tip. And uh, uh, so, so much of what we do as designers, as scene authors, is set up those declarative chains and get them ready for the first domino ready to fall and then the other behaviors come, come about as a, as a result. So this is sort of like a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, these were back, I think, uh, way back in the 30s, quite a long time ago. Here's an example. There's some fun books about these things. You probably have seen them in the, in the funnies at one point or another. Uh, but often, uh, you know, Rube Goldberg wrote dozens and dozens of these things, these very obscure and fanciful, uh, uh, I'd say funny, I guess that depends on your point of view. They look, definitely look a little dated now, but they, they are funny when you put them together because the series of events, uh, you know, the shoe kicks the football, which makes a bird open its mouth and drop a baseball, oh, well, well. We're not allowed to do that with birds anymore. But these are the comics, so I guess that's okay, and et cetera, et cetera. And finally, uh, at the end of the day, you get your wake-up clock. So, good morning. <laughs> this is one way to do it. And maybe you'll feel like this is what you're building when you put some of your routes together. But uh, it's a good way to think of it, where it's a chain of events. It's cause and effect. Uh, maybe we're going in a path that we don't necessarily want to at first, but it lets us define the reactions to things rather than try to choreograph and script and direct how everything works in combination. Instead, we do them piece by piece, and then the whole thing hangs together. Now, once we get through all the event utilities that help us hook up these animation chains, we'll also look at the script node. And so this is a, a good setup then. Why do we have a script node? Well, if X3D is declarative, there are occasions when you would like to have some more imperative programming, a sequence of steps where you're telling it, compute this, compute that. OK, if I got the first two things, I can get a third and maybe a fourth. And then tell different parts of the scene to do things in response. So script node will take those chunks of code and wrap them and make it so you could have an imperative sequence of steps consuming and producing events and those event connections are how we do the impedance matching, how we cross connect an imperative flow with the declarative flow or the overall X3D scene graph. Okay, So um, that's the theory, that's the design. It's not all brand new with uh, uh, X3D, in fact, you can see a lot of these exact same patterns if you study uh, how to write uh, sophisticated HTML pages and how to embed JavaScript in there. You'll see, oh yes, the same types of mechanisms are what's going on. Uh, X3D is a little different, but the same structure. Okay, so uh, there's also a little bit of common functionality between the event utility nodes and the script nodes. They can appear anywhere in the scene graph, just about anywhere. In other words, wherever you could put another children node. So uh, if there was a transform or if there was a shape, you could put uh, any of these utilities or any of these scripts 
right next to them. In fact, you can put them in the same places then that, uh, well, I hesitate to say that. You actually, with routes, you can put routes in a few more places. But uh, if you remember, don't put a, just as you wouldn't put a group node inside a shape or inside an appearance, you would not put any of these nodes in there. Another piece of common functionality is, gee, you better give it a def. Otherwise, uh, what's the point? It's sort of like uh, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around, does anybody hear it? Well, if an event producer is not connected to a route, does anybody hear it? No, they don't hear it because there's no way to connect the values. Okay. Similarly, just as routes don't matter where they are located uh, in the scene, their functionality is unchanged. The uh, uh, interpolators, uh, the sequencers, the event utilities, none of these matter where in the scene they go. In practice, we'll find that it's good to have a pattern, put them in sort of an order so you can draw on it and make the logic make sense. But if you want to swap them around, you can. Just make sure that they precede the def because routes, uh, excuse me, the def of the node precedes the route because if a route comes before one of the nodes that it's referring to, that's a run timeout. Okay, so within those event utilities then are sequencer nodes. We have two of them, Boolean and integer. If you think about it, those are our only two discrete types, meaning single value discontinuous types, not continuous, Boolean and integer. All right, and so the structure of these nodes are quite simpler, similar to our interpolators. Uh, but instead of producing uh, interpolated averaged set of continuously changing floating point values, either singly or in arrays, instead, for, this, for the sequences, we're either sending out booleans, meaning it's true value or false value, alternating. Here's a true, here's a true, here's a false, here's a true, here's a false, here's a false. You can keep pushing out values one at a time. Similarly, with integers, you can push out any number uh, as long as it's an integer. So for an example, we might want to change a switch node. And let's give this switch uh, lots of children. And let's say it has 10 children here. And then let's say we have an integer sequencer that's routing to that. Okay, so if we're sending values across the wire here and we send a 1, then that means it's going to select this guy. If we then send a 2, then that means it's going to select that guy instead. First a 1, then a 2. If we were continually sending integers with each clock tick, it would be like saying, switch to child 2, switch to child 2, switch to child 2, switch, uh, not much point to it, right? So this is why with the sequencer nodes, their impulse, they just send one value at a time until you tell it to send the next value. Okay, so here's an example, uh, a good one for you to walk through uh, yourself in X3D Edit. So we could see we have our typical uh, animation chain here where we're going to start with a uh, clock and that clock is driving a Boolean sequencer and then uh, uh, that Boolean sequencer hits a spotlight. I guess that'll be a light. Okay, but then we see, oh, there's another output for that clock. Those are supposed to be clock hands right there. How's that? Uh, we see we can also send it to an integer sequencer, which then hits our switch node, and that switches between its values. You can note that uh, the routes 
appear right after the nodes that they affect. First one's immediately after, the second's a little later. Okay, so there's the example. Let's look at uh, how that logic works. Well, uh, same scene graph on the bottom. We have uh, key and key value arrays. So let's look at the key array for the Boolean sequencer. We can see that it goes from 0 to 1, and it happens to go in 0.2 increments. Okay, so there's that. That looks pretty familiar. That's quite like an interpolator. <coughs> and then we have our values, true, false. Ah, here they are up here. Let's do our counting check. Remember with the uh, interpolators, we had to have a one-to-one -one pairing between them because we were defining a function. So sure enough, true, false, true, false, true, true. Why not send another true? It's not like we're sending a stream. We're just sending it again. Oh, so it works. So we have defined a discrete function and this particular function is boolean. Okay, one more look at this graph. Here's the same scene graph. This time we've got a plot showing the uh, integer sequencer. And once again we have a pairwise correspondence between the key and the key value arrays. Same key array. This time our values for key value are 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, 0. Okay. Shouldn't really draw a straight line there because they are sequential. That's what the dots are. They're just impulse sent one at a time. And there's our animation. So here's what the scene screen snapshot looks like. If we go into uh, X3D Edit and explore this thing, we'll find, okay, here's the, uh, make sure I got the right scene here. There we go, Boolean sequencer, integer sequencer. And we can see what it's doing is it's toggling the switch node, which lists each one of these texts. Child 1, child 2, child 3, each say what they are, as well as child 0. And uh, we have different colors, but you can see that it varies. Some are bright and some are not, because the lights are turning on and off as they go. So we're animating two things at a time right now, the light shining on it, as well as the uh, which of the children text nodes is being shown at a given time. To make it all go black, of course, we take advantage of switch minus one means none of the children. Okay, so I think we're, th we're set now with our first example, uh, setting up and illustrating the principles of the uh, principles of these nodes, event utilities. So uh, now that we've gone through what a sequencer node is, how they differ to interpolators, now that we've gone through the motivation, we're ready to start examining the exact nodes next time, the event utilities. See that?